Last week, we took a look at the book of Jude, the book of Jude being a single chapter. And essentially in the book of Jude, he says, I, I wanted to write to you the doctrine of salvation so that you would understand it. However, I can't do that yet because I've got to give you a warning about false prophets. And in that one chapter, he gives no less than 17 characteristics of a false prophet that they would know how to recognize what a false prophet is and the danger of such. And largely in that message, I, I was referencing, um, if you will, the big names from the big churches and and those that, uh, in, indeed, they write books, and there's a good thing for us to, to know, okay, if we're reading their books, even if we're going to a, a, a solid church, uh, if I allow this influence of a false prophet in, it, it can hurt me. And if it hurts me or my brother or sister, I, I need and I have a responsibility, an example in Christ that I should speak out out so that my brother and sister are not following in the ways of a false prophet uh, from a distance or close by, and likewise so that I don't fall into this snare. And so this morning I want us to look, as we look in the book of Titus, uh, not so much at the big names or the, the big concepts, though these concepts still apply to that, but really I want us to consider in our thinking, if you will, the reality of the threat that is in each and every local body, which calls itself the church. And as I was preparing for these two little, if you will, little mini-series, two sermons uh, on this ideal of false prophets, I couldn't help but think, you know, I've been here for just over a year now, and I think about the division that has happened in a number of churches. Church splits have happened here in the valley, and even uh, a church or two has is closed or is soon to close, largely for those reasons. And I said, you know, this is something that is practical to us. Now, I praise the Lord, at least to my knowledge in our church, we're not facing this at this time. There's no one that, at least none that I know of, that are has risen up uh, against us at this time teaching something false uh, to try to stir up and to, to trouble whole families. But I can tell you this, every church which seeks to be faithful to God has a target on its back. And Satan sees that target, and he wants to disrupt the unity and peace of every church that he can. And for this reason, as we acknowledge this, we know we should be prepared for this. And Scripture is, speaks quite abundantly on the reality of false prophets. Indeed, as we saw from the book of 1 John, you have heard it said that the Antichrist is coming. I tell you now there's a great number of Antichrist, that is, those who are in opposition to the cross, the gospel, and Jesus the Christ. They were already um, uh, plentiful in the early church, and if plentiful then, most certainly now. And so as we take a look for our visitors, I'm thankful we have you here. Uh, I like to, if I can, take from the Scripture as much as possible rather than reading into it. And so it will largely be our outline. You may notice in the verses that I've chosen, I've left out verse 12 and verse 14. So why did you do that? Well, it's because it was a, the cultural thing. It doesn't have any major impact on our message. But because it is cultural, uh, it was going to take quite a bit of explaining and might have caused confusion, and I have seven points this morning. Nine points would have been pushing both my voice and our time here, so I'm not afraid of those verses. Those verses are, are good for further study uh, and certainly do not undermine any of the points which we'll be looking at, but uh, they can cause confusion unless they've got quite a bit of explanation. That is the reason for not addressing those. We've got quite a bit already to address, but just to sum those up, um, uh, with this, it, th there were false teachers which were teaching, and particularly they were what's known as Judaizers. That they were Jewish people that had said uh, that they had come to Christ, uh, and but they were promoting cir both circumcision and Jewish ceremonies as being required in order for a person to uh, either be saved or to be sanctified. So they were being uh, 
uh, the Apostle Paul was writing against this. So with that, uh, let's get a bit of context. Titus was the name of a pastor of an early church. The Apostle Paul is the writer of the book of Titus, and he was writing to the pastor to say, listen, this is what you need to know. This is what you've got to be aware of. And I'll tell you this, brethren, if pastors in particular, and Christians as well, because we know Scripture is not just for pastors, it, written to the church and to a large degree for us as well then, uh, even as uh, those that are not pastors. He was writing to say, you've got a problem in your church, and you need to address that problem. You need to address it in an appropriate way, and here's how you do it. Because if you don't do it, Satan is going to rip apart your church, and it's going to hurt. And brethren, I can tell you, if you've ever been a part of a church split, I've been thank I'm thankful I've never been a part of one, but I've seen the aftermath of one. The uh, director of missions, my second Sunday, uh, second summer of uh, just g going in and being a fill-in pastor in Kentucky, they don't have enough pastors. Uh, they've got churches where people need to be because they're really small and they're in hollers and nobody can get to them unless you get a four-wheel drive and. They just don't want to do that. So, you know, we, we went, and he, he guess he thought it would be funny to put me in the midst of them about two weeks after a major split. That was a fun summer. Um, but I can tell you, if you've ever been a part of one, a church split is, is not something that is fun to go through, particularly if you invested your heart into that. And, brethren, that's, that's my desire for us this year. You know, I spent the first year presenting the gospel, and I'm going to continue to do that as long as the good Lord uh, allows me to stand in front of, of a congregation, is that I would present the gospel in its pure and undefiled way as much as possible. But this year, I also want to focus on us not just being, uh, you know, the typical church. I want us to be a family bound by Christ, bound in Christ to one another. For we have a common faith and salvation, if indeed we are of the Lord. And I tell you, you invest your heart in that, and then that get ripped apart. That hurts. That takes a lot of time and a lot of prayer and a lot of counseling to get over. And Satan desires to hurt Christians as much as he can. If he can't rob you of your salvation, he'll try to rob you of your joy and of your peace, and if possible, even your ministry. I can tell you that. And so we need to be aware of this and how to approach it. So let's take a look at it if we can. First of all, from the NASB, the first words of this uh, verse 10 is, there are. That is, it is a matter of fact that this is a situation that churches are in, and particularly in this context, the church which Titus was pastor over. And I can tell you this, it's every church in which will not address it. There are, what are, there are many rebellious men. That, and by the way, it applies to women as well. In this case, it, it just references men, but women can do damage as well, and we're going to see why. There are. We need to understand this is the case. You'll see the title of my message, They Profess to Know God. For our application today, they claim to be Christian, but they're not, or at least a large amount of them are not. We'll see that there are some that are. Even Christians can fall into this disruptive false teachings, but for a large amount, we are indeed uh, referencing those which are the Antichrist, that is, those who are opposed to the cross. They come bringing a different gospel, and according to Galatians 1, are accursed of God, for there is only one gospel, which is the power of God to save. And we need to recognize they are. They are all around us, brother. And I would say this, this is a plague of the American church that there are a great number which bring uh, rebellious talk, empty speech, and are deceiving a great many. And this is dangerous. For indeed, if a person does not hold to the gospel, what salvation do they have? There is none apart from the gospel of Christ Jesus. And it is a common problem. There were many then, there are many now. Now, because there are many, should we say, okay, well, we'll just have peace with this? By no means. You are advocating for the spiritual well-being both of yourself, your family, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Unity within a church is good. They say doctrine divides. Doctrine is just a teaching. Doctrine does divide, and rightly so. It divides truth 
from error. And those who know the truth have no need for lies. For we speak the truth, and there ought to be only truth found in us. And what fellowship can one who knows the truth have with those who bring lies? There ought not be that fellowship. The vision is right when, it, when the truth is at stake. And that's what we're seeing here. There are many rebellious ones, so we need to approach them, but first we need to recognize them. Rebellious men, what are they rebelling against? This is my proposal. They're not just rebelling against you. Indeed, in this context, they were rebelling against Paul. They were bringing into question whether Paul was an apostle, whether or not his writings were Scripture, that is, whether it's authoritative word of God. By the way, the apostle Peter, uh, in his uh, epistle, says, you know, they, men pervert the writings of Paul just as they do the rest of Scriptures, okay? That means he is asserting the writings of Paul are the writings of or the the inspired word of God equal with the Old Testament scriptures as well. So they're rebelling against Paul, and indeed they're rebelling against Titus as well. They're coming up against the pastor that is seeking to be biblical, seeking to be faithful. What does that look like? Well, first of all, as we saw last week, they're not just teaching the happy parts. They're not just teaching the parts that they like. For what shepherd, if he comes to you and says, I'll, I'll feed your sheep, I'll gather them, I'll water them, but if wolves come, I'm not, I'm not helping them. Uh, Sorry about your luck. Or if people come to steal your sheep, well, I'm not going to do anything there either. That's not a pleasant part of the job. If they're not doing both parts of the gospel or of their duty, then they're not being a biblical man. Likewise, if they're not bringing both parts of the gospel, both the law of God, this is the reason that God is holy and you are sinful, and also the grace and forgiveness found in Christ Jesus and the love of God with which he lavishes upon us, well, we need to bring both of those. The, indeed, to preach the full counsel of the word of God. Titus was seeking to do this. Or Paul is not saying, Titus, you're doing a miserable job. He's saying, Titus, you got guys that are upsetting your authority. They're rebelling against him. And not only this, but also the office of pastor. You know, I, we're filling out, my wife and I are seeking to... Um, uh, to become uh, homeowners uh, here in Pahrump. And, uh, man, you, you'll be astonished at the number of packets. I mean, just one paper after another. They went 10 years of work history. And at, at one point, I was a back doc uh, worker at a Sears. And it's like, well, what was my official title? Uh, minimum wage worker. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, you, you have to kind of come up with a title that accurately represents what you did because there was no official title. You were the guy that uh, was replaceable, essentially. You know, the pastor of title, uh, the title of pastor is not like that. This is an office which is ordained by God. And what you'll find in the book of uh, the two books of Timothy and the book of Titus is 21 qualifications for a pastor. If a man falls short of one of those 21 qualifications, he's not biblically qualified to be a pastor. And so there are big shoes that a pastor has to, to make sure to fill and to stand in. And, and these men were uncertain that, that as they were claiming of a biblical man that he was not following the path of God. This is a dangerous thing, for Scripture tells us, do not remove a pastor without good reason. Now, there is sometimes good reasons. That is, they may be rebellious men who do not manage their homes well and bring a false gospel, and they're not doing what they are to do. Titus was not this example. And so these men were rebelling against Paul and Titus and the office of pastor, and in doing so, rebellious men today as well, they're not just speaking out against the gospel. Indeed, they are. The gospel is what they're rebelling against, but they are speaking out against God as well. This is the reason false prophets uh, are, are serious for us. I want you to know that they're serious because they're not just blasphemy against men. They're blasphemy against God, denying the one Lord and Jesus. And, of course, the gospel as well. Bringing that which does not save. False gospels make false converts. Thirdly, they are rebelling against the very souls of those who are following them. 
and ultimately by misleading some, which is what was happening in this situation, it's what happens in a great many situations today. If you will, they become clicky. That's kind of a new new age term to say this. You know, you've got those that follow this pastor, and then you've got those that follow this guy over here because the pastor put him in a I don't know a teaching position and probably shouldn't have. That's deadly to a church, brother. Because you polarize those that follow this man and those that follow this man, just as happened in a new church. Who are you to say you follow Paul and, and I follow Titus and, and I follow Peter? No, we have one Lord. There is one body, which is the church. And the congregation is called to follow the shepherd and the New Testament church, the shepherds, because it was multiple pastors, as they follow Christ. Or as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow me, that is Paul, for as I follow Christ, his example. And so they are seeking and misleading those very souls which are following them within their rebellion as well as the unity and the peace of the church. Consider this, if you will. Such men desire such power that they are willing, if someone walks in, that the church be disorganized and fighting against itself so that when an unbeliever looks, they say, well, there's no unity, there's no peace here. This is what Satan wants. You have an enemy that is not a flesh and blood, brethren. Our church has this enemy, as does every church in this valley, if it seeks to be biblical. He seeks to tear apart this unity that the church would have no impact. Lastly, they are ultimately rebellious men who are rebelling against their very own selves. That is, they are walking blindly down a path of their own destruction. What characterizes these men? How do we know them? Jesus says you will know a man by the fruit which he bears, if he is a good tree or a bad tree. Likewise, you will know a ravenous wolf by what he teaches and by the way which he lives. In this immediate scripture, we are told these men are empty talkers. They are deceivers. They are teaching things which they ought not teach. And they teach with the, the motivation of gaining, as it says here, sordid gain. They are defiled in all which they do. Because of this motivation, they are unbelieving. Both their mind and their conscience are defiled so that they cannot even follow their own conscience, which we'll see in a little bit. They claim to know God, but by their deeds, they are denying his lordship, being detestable in their nature as well as their actions, being disobedient and ultimately being completely and totally worthless for any good deed. Now you say, well, that's, man, that is really harsh to say there. We don't talk that way uh, nowadays. Uh, well, God's Word does. And so we need to as well. This is the danger. It's not that we should put up with rebellious men or women. Those which would disturb a church, which would bring a false teaching. Because ultimately, they're not going to have any good. You, you put up with someone hoping that their potential would come out. But that's not going to happen in this case. Not unless the Lord grants repentance. I want to hit on a few of these to place emphasis. That is, first of all, and do not be fooled, the title of Christian does not qualify anybody to teach, nor should we really read a whole lot into it nowadays. Indeed, uh, even at the Balloon Fest this weekend, a man, a man walked up. They had talked uh, with the people that were doing the booth, uh, and they said, you need to talk to our pastor. And he walked up and said, okay, uh, so you're uh, an evangelical Christian. Yeah, yeah. Evangelical just means we evangelize. We, we go forth speaking the word, filling the Great Commission. Yes, sir. Which is odd. It's, it's terrible that you even have to qualify that. For every Christian has the Great Commission. We see this in Scripture. But there are those that claim to be Christian would say, we don't need to evangelize. That's not for us. 
But I said, yeah, you know, I, I'm an evangelical Christian. We're a Southern Baptist church. And he's like, okay, well, what do you believe? What do you teach? You know, the reason he had to ask that is because you, you can look at the Christian faith, unfortunately, at least those that are under that title, and you can find just about any type of teaching that you want to find. This is what, this is where Satan has brought the church because they have submitted to his influence. Now, I'll tell you this, it is under the sovereignty of God that this has happened. For God gives to people false prophets because they desire to hear and have their ears tickled. It is not that any man has walked into any church apart from the sovereignty of God. But the Christian title means very little today, at least in when it speaks of what is being taught, what is being held to, and what is being believed. And unfortunately, it even means little as to how do you live your life. Because I can tell you this, brethren, there's not a single person who has been saved which would not also be able to reflect the lordship of Jesus. If Jesus is your Savior, he is your Lord as well. And that will be evident. You will know them by their fruit. Consider, if you will, even the thief upon the cross. This man died hours after coming to salvation. And yet we can now, 2,000 years, look and say, look at his powerful testimony. At the brink of death, he is a, a symbol of hope because he repented and believed in the Lord Jesus. And that day was in, with Jesus in paradise. And so you do let us not then say, okay, this person says he's a Christian. Uh, Christian inspirational speakers, if you want to look at the, the writers and the big names, don't buy into that. Don't put your guard down just because they take a title. If you will, though, you know, some people say, well, a lot of people, they go into Christian music because it's easier to get into than secular music. They get their name out there, and then they transition to you know, whatever genre that they want. That's a common practice nowadays. Brethren, Christians are not called to be naive. Don't put your guard down just because somebody says he is a brother or sister in Christ. You, you look and say, okay, what do you believe? How do you live your life? What's going on? For they claim, they profess to know God. But by their deeds, they deny him. A man will be known by his deeds and also by his confession. With what they profess, I would propose this, much of what a false teacher teaches is the wisdom of man. That is, they will tell you what you agree with. Beware of that. There should be scripture. As you walk further and further along in your walk of faith, God should be conforming your mind, changing your mind, so that your mind, what you think, what you agree with, better matches the word of God. But beware of those that are just telling you things that you agree with. Indeed, I hope, I pray from time to time that I will step on each and every one of your toes. <laughs> because there's an offensive nature to the Word of God. Because the Word of God is holy and we still have sin which remains in us. We've been justified before God. But I testify to you, just as First John, that he who says he has no sin lies and does not practice the truth. And our sin is offensive to God. And as long as we love our sin, as long as we practice our sin, the Word of God is going to be offensive to us. It needs to be. Because it is that offense. We call it conviction. We say, okay, the way that I think, the way that I talk, the way that I live doesn't match with Scripture. That's God revealing to you, this is where you need to change. He who is not changing has a problem. For each and every one of us, as long as we walk upon this face of this earth, we have room to improve. And the means by which we do this is by Scripture. But a man will come and will say the things which you like. He will tell you stories which are entertaining, tell you jokes which will make you laugh, and none of these things are on par with the Word of God. Beware of those. Whether they stand, if I've done my job, they won't stand in this pulpit. But if you read them, if you watch them on television, if you listen to them on the radio, if you find this to characterize them, these men are empty talkers. They deceive people rather than having the full counsel of the Word of God. Point four. 
A false prophet is worthless for any good deed because they have been corrupted both inside and out. Both their minds and their conscience are defiled, and by their deeds they deny God. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, we can't see the inside. That's true. You can't look at a man's heart. Neither can I. Neither can anybody you've met. God can judge the, the heart and the motivations of man, and he will. And that ought to terrify a lot of people. But you can know the inside, or man's heart, if you will, if you will judge the outside of their actions. Now, nowadays, they say, well, don't judge. Well, that, that scripture has context, brethren. And it is not that you should not judge, but rather you should not judge hypocritically. Rather, you are to test every spirit by the word of God. And if you examine, you say, okay, this person and what they're saying and the way that they're living, this doesn't match Jesus. Now, nobody's going to be perfect. But if you look and say, this man's life is filled with controversy and not the good kind of controversy. You share the gospel today, you'll have a life filled with controversy. But if it's com controversial against the word of God, this is a problem. Between the faith and salvation, which is common among all true believers, that is a problem. Indeed, examine a man to know if he is a wolf or indeed a shepherd. To which I'll say this, one who is a false teacher, a rebel, you'll notice in the scripture, it never says that he's a fellow elder or a fellow overseer or a fellow pastor. There are those that are not in a high-ranking position which can cause as much or more damage. Why? Because they want the, the exercise of the, the freedom, but they don't want the responsibility of the pastorship. Beware of this, brethren. For a man does not have to take a title of pastor to mislead. We are told, or at least seen in this example, we are not to be put alongside such men. As a Christian, is to have nothing to do with any appearance of wickedness. And indeed, what we're supposed to do is call them out, reprove them. And so we ought to. They may say, and I've run into this, that my emotions, that is, I mean, I sit under, I, I talk to this person, and I just feel warm and fuzzy inside. And I've had good experiences with them. I'm alarmed at how often I hear this. Brethren, such emotions, such experiences, whether we've had them or if we hear a testimony of others, these things are not on par with the Word of God. If the Word of God stands against such a man then we ought to stand against them as well. Fifthly, they and all who follow them will fall into the enemy snares due to their conscience. Conscience is the thing in Scripture that you follow, if you will. And there's a thing about sin. Sin doesn't just take you to a point and stop. That's not the nature of sin. Sin is a downward spiral into destruction. It will destroy a man's life. As one uh, pastor once said, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you ever thought you would pay. John MacArthur makes a comment on this scripture. He says, concerning the mind and the conscience, he says, if the mind is defiled, it cannot accurately inform the conscience. So the conscience in itself cannot warn the person rightly. When the conscience is accurately and fully infused with God's truth, it functions as a warning system as God has designed it. Let me break that down for you if I can. If a person, the way they interpret information is perverted, then the way then their conscience will then be informed by the way they view everything, and they will not be able to say, okay, this is a dangerous thing. And so what you will find is a person who is devoid of the truth or has a little bit of the truth and a whole lot of perversion, that's the way it usually happens, is they will be approving of the things which ought not be approved of, and they will have no discernment between that which is almost right and that which is right. 
Indeed, they will not even have a passion truly for that which is good. For a man cannot love both that which is good and that which is evil. The two things are in opposition to one another. God has designed man. Unfortunately, we are fallen due to the uh, rebellion, the sin. But he has designed a man's conscience to be an early warning system. It is only when that conscience is informed by the Word of God, and by this I don't mean some personal revelation or somebody wakes up and says, okay, God told me this this morning. No, God's Word is what is being referenced here, that which is never changing. It's not something that's private, though it is personal, because it is there for each and every person. This is the ultimate standard, brethren. This is how we will know it is the full counsel of the Word of God. And I would tell you this, you will not get the full counsel of the Word of God in a way in which you need it by listening to me three times a week, half-hour blocks. You need to be in the Word of God each and every day. Sixthly, how must we approach such a rebellious individual? And what are the stakes? We are told in this scripture, they must be silenced. As, in the, uh, as Paul wrote to Timothy, he says to him, don't engage in foolish discussion with them. You silence them. Or as Paul himself spoke uh, against the Judaizers, he said, I, I'm not even going to give them an hour of my time to let them speak. This isn't a discussion, a conversation. It is me proclaiming the truth. Such men, when we find with discernment according to the word of God, by the way, a good thing about having a biblical church is if you don't know for sure, you should be able to go to a brother or sister in Christ and say, okay, what do you think about this? Because this is what I've seen. This is what I've heard. What do we need to do? Not in a way to spread gossip, but in a way to address someone to say, this may be a serious danger. They must be silenced. And we are to reprove them and this is scripture. We must reprove them severely. A lot of people say, well, you got to always speak, speak nicely to someone. Sometimes you shouldn't be speaking nicely, particularly myself as a pastor. If I find a person is looking to destroy you as a congregation, the last thing you want me to do when we found out that nature is to speak to them kindly because they might stay. You know, church isn't about getting a bunch of people together. It's about the holy worship of God and the feeding of the sheep. And sometimes that means chasing away wolves. And how does a shepherd do that? Well, he, they take the rod and they smack the wolf on the head. <laughs> now, I'm too little of a guy. I'm not going to be striking nobody. But sometimes there needs to be a severe speech. And by this, I do not mean that which is wicked. I do not mean cursing, as some pastors today have Use it, but I mean with the word of God. Say, you are a wolf seeking to devour my sheep, and you are not welcome. This is what is necessary for the health of a church because we labor against forces that seek to destroy us. They seek to destroy the ministry of a church. They must be silenced. Why? Scripture tells us they are upsetting whole families. The nature of a false prophet, one who is a rebellious man, an empty talker, a deceiver, is he doesn't keep to himself. He wants to lead others. And the way he'll do this is he'll go into one uh, uh, individual of a family and he'll introduce this false teaching. And now you've got one individual of the family holding to the gospel, one individual that's strain, and there's controversy there, and not only upsetting, you know, the, the thing that he's trying to keep, because upsetting can lead to destroying, to ripping apart and separating. And brethren, I'll tell you this, there is a false um, statistic that people will say, if you check up on it, you will find that it is false. The divorce rate within the American church is not equal to that of the rest of of the nation. The rest of the nation a few years ago was 50% uh, divorce rate. So half of people that get married would get divorced. The church with those that were attending church regularly was significantly lower. Satan would love for us to have not only on par 
with the statistic of the rest of the world, but he would r love to see Christian churches as a place to go if you want to get divorced. That is the way and nature of our enemy. He wants to upset whole families. And I've, I've been saying, and will continue to do so, the foundation of the church is largely going to be the family. That is, your worship that you do Sunday mornings ought to be an overflow of what you are doing Monday through Sunday. Include Sunday in your family worship, brethren. This is how we keep the Sabbath holy. It's not just not doing anything. It's devoting it to God. How is your family worship, brethren? Men, are you leading your wives and your children in such a way that you will know and they will be aware that Satan would have his way with them if you were not protecting them and equipping them? Indeed, what you will find, if you will practice family worship on a regular basis, first it will be awkward, and then it will become precious, and it will have a positive and powerful impact on your corporate worship. For this is a time of families coming together and worshiping. If you don't have children, let me tell you this, a family is not uh, three or more. A family, the first family, which Satan attacked, was a man and his wife. You don't cease to be a family when your children move out. With this, we are to silence them, and this was... I love this. This is a gracious part of this verse. So that they may be sound in the faith and worthy of the good deeds of the kingdom of God. So there are some that are rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers that might still be redeemed. That might still, if we would rebuke them harshly. First, by the way, go, go to them graciously. Find out you got all your facts straight. But when, when you found that out, fight for their soul. Fight for them in such a way as you might win over your brother. So that would, if they indeed are redeemed, they would look back perhaps years from then and say, you were really going toe-to-toe -to -toe against the influences of evil that was in me for the sake of my soul. I can see you love me. Seek that they might be found to be worthy of good deeds. Indeed, without the, uh, the true gospel, there's no evangelism going on. If you're taking a false gospel, you're not doing the work of Jesus. By the way, the gospel of salvation is by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ and none other. There is coming a day in which Jesus is coming back. He's going to judge the world, and all who are outside of him shall be eternally condemned. But those who are in him shall have everlasting life. And the time for that, that is resting in Jesus, is not at the time that you die. Start that now. Start that relationship and that experience with him, the joy and the peace that is found in him. Seek that now. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek that they would be found to be sound in the faith. For then they can go forward and do the work of evangelism. They can then uh, equip brothers and sisters in Christ for this. Seventhly and lastly, we will find this. Both sound doctrine and righteous works are the mark of a true convert. Okay? If, you've, if you've got all the head knowledge in the world... But you don't do nothing but sit down and watch TV and go to work, but you don't share the gospel with nobody. And we tell you, there's still reason to question your salvation. Why? Because the one who has truly been saved has a love for the glory of God. He seeks that people would come to worship him and be filled with the joy and peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. He has a brokenness for the lost that he would see them have that joy and become disciples who make disciples. If you've got all the head knowledge in the world, that won't save you. It is the relationship of Christ which is found in sound doctrine, that is the gospel. Doctrine is just a teaching, that's all that is. We'll see that in righteous works. Additionally, though, a man is not saved by righteous works. 
if a man is, is doing all the good deeds in the world, but he doesn't have faith, Scripture says you, a man without faith cannot please God. He who has been born again cannot please God. Works will not save a man, but they are evidence of a salvation that is found in faith. What does your works say about you, brethren? What does your confession say about you? And to which I'll say this, a lack of works is not, or that is a lack of bad works is not on par with, a la, uh, not on par with actually doing righteous works. A lot of people say, well, I don't do bad stuff. Okay, but well, what service for the kingdom of God are you doing, Christian? If indeed you are Christian. Likewise, the lack of sound doctrine and the lack of righteous works are a mark of an imposter. If it is one which is proclaiming a false teaching and seeking to lead others, it is a mark of a false prophet. Or at the very least, it is a mark of a double-minded man, one who claims to have a love for Jesus but does not have the gospel, one who does not seek peace, one that does not love the order of church. That is, a, this church, this worship is to be orderly. What does your theology? You say, what is theology? Well, theo, God, Ali, study of. So it's a thoughts or study of God. Are you studying so that you would know and have right thoughts about God? If you do not desire to know God, that's a problem. As Paul Washer once put it, he says, it's the, the right question isn't, do you want to go to heaven? The question is, do you want God? A Christian wants God, brother. What is what you're telling people? saying about you. A fundamental indifference toward God or a lack of desire to know him better is a telling sign of a heart which has not yet been changed. For when the heart has been changed, the mind follows it. Has the Lord changed your mind, brethren? What does your deeds say about you? Oh, that we would seek that when we enter in or when we stand before the Lord that day, he will say unto us, Well done, my good and faithful servant. If you've not yet come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if your confession, your thoughts about God have reflected this, if your lack of seeking salvation of the lost and, and promoting the church and furthering the kingdom of God, if they reflect this, if you believe that you've been chased, uh, that you've been following, if you will, uh, false prophets, if you don't have a discernment from truth, from error, let me tell you, this very hour, let this hour be the hour of salvation. May this hour be the time which... The rest of your life changes, and more importantly, your whole eternal destination changes. It can be. Romans 10 tells us, He who believes in the Lord and confesses Him with his lips, believes with Him upon all of his heart, he shall not be disappointed, but shall be saved. The salvation is from the wrath of God, according to Romans 8, 8, or 1, 18. The wrath of God has poured out upon all unrighteousness. It is a salvation from the sins which have held you captive. Jesus says that he who practices sin is a slave to them. That is that you would be redeemed and go forth and sin no more. Not that any of us walk perfectly, but that you would struggle and labor, labor with the flesh victoriously. For the book of James tells us, if you will draw near unto the Lord, he will draw near to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is a promise only for those in Christ Jesus and none other. May this time be a time of, of transformation for us, brother. If you will, please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as you show us time and time again in your scripture, you have little patience with false prophets. Our Lord Jesus called them hypocrites. He said that yet you are whitewashed tombs. The outside, they look nice, but on the inside, they are a mess of spiritual depravity and death. Lord, we must confess, apart from your grace, we would be in this condition ourselves. 
apart from your Spirit guiding us in accordance with your Word, Lord, we would have no wisdom nor discernment. But your Word testifies that he who seeks wisdom may he ask it of the Lord and that you would grant it to us abundantly. Lord, we seek your wisdom this morning. Lord, I ask that you would remove false prophets, that you would remove their books from our library, that we would no longer watch them on television, that we would not stand their words upon our radio, that we would not be fooled by the title of Christian, but rather that we would, with discernment, seek to understand a man's heart by looking at his actions and listening to his confession. Lord, I ask that if we find that his actions and confessions do not match that of the common faith and salvation which the church truly has, that we would reject such a one. And Lord, if they're in our midst, I ask that we would approach them first by grace, that we would follow your word, that if they won't repent of their sin, that we go to them with another brother or sister. If they still will not do this, may we take them then before the church. And Lord, I ask that you would grant repentance to those within this valley, that are rebellious men, empty talkers, that are deceivers, they are seeking only their own profit. Lord, your word testifies that he who gains this world is forfeiting his soul. What profits a man to do such? But rather, Lord, I ask that we would seek the kingdom of God, that we would be satisfied in you, for we know that you are able and willing to provide us with all that we need and that you are greater than any and everything which this world offers. Indeed, Lord, what this world offers is temporary. It promises satisfaction but ultimately ends in disappointment. And he who follows it ends in destruction. So, Lord, I ask that you would grant salvation this very morning that your spirit would come upon someone to change their hearts. You would give them eyes to see and ears to hear, a heart to believe. For your word is true, and we rest upon it. It's in these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.